Hi guys, Ashton here, and welcome back to Precision Horology. Uh, today I wanted to go through something um, kind of interesting, that I find interesting anyway, uh, and that's the Omega Flight Master. Now the Omega Flight Master uh, is a pretty simple uh, watch movement. It's based um, on the 861 movement, but it has a few modifications. Uh, so it's the 911, the 911 uh, Omega movement that we have stamped on the main plate here. So if we were to look at it from the uh, movement side of the watch, we would recognize that that is an Omega 861 chronograph movement. But it's when we turn it over and look back at that dial side uh, that we notice a few extra pieces. Um, we notice that we have a wheel uh, on top of our hour wheel. We have a different bridge set up here uh, to an 861, and then we have a different lever set up here uh, and an extended piece um, on our uh, setting lever here. So what's all this for? Well, if we have a look at the 86, uh, or we have a look at the Flightmaster dial, um, it has a relatively similar dial to another Speedmaster, except with the introduction of another hand we have a 24 hour hand or a second time zone hand uh, that we use uh, on the watch. Now, the watch has its regular chronograph pushes here, start, stop, and we have our regular crown that goes through here. We have an inner rotating bezel uh, via this crown, and then we have another crown here, which turns and rotates our 24 hour hand or our second time zone hand. So when we turn that crown, our second time zone hand moves. Now, this is pretty different to a lot of other watches that'll have a second time zone because normally uh, they'll jump um, and they'll be uh, operated via the regular crown, you could say. Uh, but this one's operated by a separate crown. You don't even have to do anything. You just have to turn that crown um, and, and that hand will set. So let's have a look at how this all functions, which is kind of the interesting part, um, uh, in my opinion. So the watch is in the winding position. We move it to the hand setting position. Now we'll notice that when we move it to the hand setting position, we see this lever here engage into this top wheel. So we see that's engaged. Now, when we turn our hands here, we can see our minute wheel moving underneath and we can see the teeth of our hour wheel moving, which is what our hour hand sits on. But we'll notice that our wheel on top and this wheel here, they aren't moving. Now, why not? Well, they're not moving because our lever has blocked. Now, if we were to pull our lever away, what would happen? If we put our lever away, see that? The wheel on top moves. But when we're setting the time regular, when we're setting the regular time, we don't want our second time zone hand to move. Now, when we push it back and the watch is in hand setting position, the lever or the watch is in winding position, the lever is not engaged. So when the watch is running in its regular format, our second time zone hand will follow around at the same rate as our hour hand, uh, exactly uh, at the same speed as it were. So it would move around and it would follow and if it's 12 o'clock on the regular hand and four o'clock, it's always gonna be four hours different on the dial. Except when we go to manually set the time and we change our regular time zone. So how do we set our, re uh, our 24 hour hand? Well, we have our extra crown as mentioned and we have a small wheel here or a pinion. Now this pinion acts against this pinion here and this pinion comes down and meshes and engages with that wheel. 
and our stem, or our crown, I should say, actually sits and is connected to the end of that wheel. It sits on there like so. And when that's turned, it moves that in a wheel and then our wheel uh, in the movement here is turned. So if we go ahead and we manually turn that wheel, what do we see? Well, we see our second time zone, we can only move it one way. Our second time zone now moves. We can only move it clockwise. When we go anti-clockwise, it doesn't work. So we can only move the wheel clockwise. Now we notice that our regular hour wheel and minute wheel don't turn. So we're only setting our um, uh, second time zone wheel. So there you have it. Now, how does it all work? Well, it's actually quite clever the way it works. If we start to dismantle our movement, we can actually have a look at the inner workings. So we remove our spring, our friction spring, and then we can remove our wheel on top. Now, our wheel is a double-mounted double, double mounted wheel like so. And then we have a friction spring underneath that provides friction to that wheel. Now, we have a series of wheels here. Go from one to the other to our wheel that gets moved. And then to our actual wheel uh, on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the hour wheel for our second time zone. Now... The real heart of the whole thing lies within this wheel here. Because remember, when the watch is running, this wheel has to have enough friction to stay attached to that hour wheel so it doesn't move independently. However, it can't have so much friction that when we pull it into handset and the brake is applied, that it requires so much force to move that hand round. So it needs to have just a right, the right amount of friction. Now how do we get that? Well, you see, we can pull it off and we can look at the wheel. Now, do you notice there's a spring across? We have a spring here and that spring puts tension on the shaft of the hour wheel. And when it needs to clip in there and hold it and follow around, it can. But then when it needs to have the brake applied against it and pull away to be moved independently. There's enough or not so much friction there that it allows that to happen. So that is basically how the second time zone feature of the Flightmaster works. It works very differently to um, any other second time zone or GMT watches out there today. Um, it's one of my favorite second time zone watches to work on. I, uh, I really love working on it. Um, it's, it's just a very, very cool watch and they have a cult following, but, uh, they're fairly under, uh, appreciated in my opinion. So I'm going to go ahead and get to servicing this one. Um, get to stripping it down. This isn't going to be, um, a YouTube rebuild, uh, but there is actually a step-by-step uh, that's up on my blog over at precisionhorology.com. So if you want to um, see the rebuild, you can head over to my website, precisionhorology.com. Uh, have a look at the blog, and it's going to be up in the uh, in the coming days. So uh, you can see a step-by-step -step process of that uh, and all the, all the ways that we're going to repair that. So that'll be up um, in the coming days. Uh, so please, guys, uh, if you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel. Um, it really helps me to be able to make more content um, like this video and also share it with everybody you know uh, that might have an interest in horology uh, and general watchmaking because uh, the more subscribers we get, uh, the more content I'm able to, uh, to put out there. So thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.